members uh, of the Guam Memorial Hospital from whatever positions that you are in. Thank you so much for what you're doing in serving the people of Guam in a task that is unique from any other agency, any other group of this island. You are life or death, and you, you, you provide this service whether someone can pay for it or not. There is no other entity in this island that has that tremendous and awesome responsibility. Uh, as we move forward in this, by the way, this, this is my six years, of, going on my six years as governor, 10 years as a senator, there's been one interesting and repeating occurrence, at least from a policy level, as a senator or as the chief executive. Every three or four years, this hospital is in critical condition uh, and is in need of a massive infusion uh, from the policy-making body. And it would be like, in a, since you are in the business of saving lives, it has been since I've been a public servant, someone who is drowning. And just when they're about ready to get their last breath, they're pulled up right about six inches from the surface of the water and take a few deep breaths. And then the weight upon them, they sink. Those hardworking people in the hospital are in that situation since I've been 16 years as a public servant. When we looked at that, we've seen certain issues there with the HMAC coming together, these folks from all sectors of, of our administration working with collaboration support with all the different sectors of the Guam Memorial Hospital, come up with a plan. It's gonna be simple. It's gonna be a simple plan from treading water and being near a drowning state, which we've been in for decades, and then being pulled up and breathing a few big deep breaths, and then going back underwater and repeating it again and again and again, this whole thing is about taking it from that scenario that has been for so too, too long to being put in the top of Mount Lanham. It has to be a transformational change. The hospital and what it stands for, we need to look at it and we got to ensure that moving forward, we will be taken out of this continued repetitive cycle that has been going, going for too long. And it needs tough decisions. Obviously when we came together, we looked at areas that we need to do some efficiencies and, 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 and cost, cost cutting. We found that. At the same time, there are things that could be done internally, whether it's the rate structure, finding different ways through internal revenue generation. And then probably one that's going to be the most controversial, if we are to put us at Mount Lamlam, it is the social contract of this community, this island, in ensuring that this hospital is given the necessary resources financially, the necessary facilities and equipment to ensure that it is the top quality health care uh, facility and institution uh, in this part of the world. It's about this transformational change. And it's going to be some tough decisions. I understand that. I'm a conservative Republican. You know, it is almost, it is not of my philosophy when it comes when it comes to increasing taxes or increasing fees. But this is a unique institution and there is a social contract. And I must tell you, I wish I had the Assistant Secretary of Interior here. She wasn't here too long ago, a few days ago. But at least she knows our issues and she's been very sympathetic. But some of them, and you know it, whether it's a treaty uh, that brings in many people <coughs> God bless them, but they come here because they don't have the opportunity to get health care in their, in their islands. That responsibility has been put upon the people of Guam and this hospital. Unfortunately, and this goes back a long way, if they treat us with Medicaid or with Medicare one way, completely completely alien to how they treat the other 50 states, that's another issue. Uh, I could go on and on. Some of the major burdens have occurred here, not as a result of even policy of the people of Guam, but decisions made thousands and thousands of miles away in Washington, D.C. But we still are humans. We still believe 
that we cannot look the other way to our fellow brothers and sisters. And if the federal government will, will not uphold their part of the bargain, and whether it was a treaty, whether it was fairness and equity in Medicaid or earn income tax credit, <coughs> then we, the people of Guam, have to do it. As tough as that is. So this is a well thought out plan. It will, if fully consummated, pay all the vendor bills, give an additional working capital. I hope I'm not going to steal everything from you. <laughs> uh, enough cash working capital moving forward uh, to pay our bills. It will give us enough uh, in terms of financing to do the necessary repair work, to do the necessary uh, renovations and capital improvements, uh, and also to purchase equipment. And then with that, it doesn't end there, a sustainable funding source moving forward so we don't have to, three years from now, come back to a legislature or come back to a governor because we are underwater drowning. Uh, this is a long-term plan to ensure that our hospital will, will be hospital will be in the top of the priority list because of its mission, rather than something that unfortunately every three or four years uh, is brought to the headline and in need of a bit. And I want to thank all of you for participating in putting this plan together. And I look forward to working with you collaboratively uh, with the legislature and the community and the community to effectuate the ratification uh, of this policy and this bill that will be introduced today. God bless you all. And God bless one more hospital. Yeah. And that was really state of the art, and you know those details other people will go into. Um, but it's also you know I walked in with an insurance card, and how many of us have in insurance in here? Just raise your hand. All of us understand. All of us don't have to worry when we get sick or a loved one who is a dependent of ours. I don't have any dependents. Get sick. I have a dog with pets. When they get sick. You don't have to worry, but there are some 67,000 people on this island who do have to worry. And they're not your, your on welfare lower class type of people because they have, they can avail of Medicaid and MIP. These are people who are business owners and they have maybe eight employees or they're managers of companies that have 50 or fewer employees and they don't have health insurance. And they cannot avail of Medicaid and MIP so that when they get sick, they make a decision not to go to see the doctor and then perhaps something develops and then they come to GMH where the cost is extraordinary or if their child gets sick they don't want to take a chance they bring their child to GMH's door and something that would have cost them $200 at a clinic would now cost them $600 had a mandate a corporate mandate say you know what it's okay pay us later here's a room it would be a completely unsustainable operation they would need to cut their employees, no matter that they need those employees in order to maintain the level of service, so they need to raise their rates, they would need to raise more money so that they could afford that additional $25. So when people say operate GMH like a business, people first have to understand that they're talking about apples and oranges because of that federal money. So, and we didn't even talk about profit. And we don't need to talk about that because that is completely irrelevant to the GMH model. You're not in it for the profit, you're in it to save lives. Because, well, one, you have a federal mandate to. But more importantly, and I don't know if you all agree, but I hope you would all agree, that it is part of our true moral values to help people who are in need, and we believe that it is a human right to have health care on this island. Governor Cowell certainly believes that. And so in understanding what the problems are, um, now we can move forward and hopefully as a community accept the solutions that we need in order to solve these problems. And, some, and, and as I understand it from the HMAT team, some 10% of the problems are self-inflicted and there are fixes for that and fixes that currently are happening right now thanks to all of you. Oh, but the other not well, Can I add this because I was talking to Jim Gilling yesterday. We're going to go over 100 million in Medicaid. We've got a bunch of doctors in the states that are all upset at the Medicaid rates. You understand Guam it's a two punch. Number one punch is for the new ceiling, 100% care uh, funded by the federal government, zero by the state government. Well, one, 55, 45. Even at the exist existing rates that are charged, 
uh, we are, at this hospital, are even lower than Medicaid established Medicare rates. 90% of the problem are things we don't have control over. So the Medicare, the rebasing of Medicare, and we can hold our breaths all we want and hope for Congress, an act of Congress, to change, uh, to rebase our Medicare rates and have that cascade into uh, meaningful solutions for Medicaid and MIP. But if this was the Hilton corporate board, they wouldn't be holding their breaths for a federal mandate to change. They would have to adjust their own business model. And that's what we are suggesting here. To address the 90% of the financial issues that we have no control over, we're saying we've got to raise our own money. And it's basically really and something we should be really proud of, actually, is we're, we're, what we're really saying is we're no longer going to be dependent on an act of Congress or on some federal whatever. We're going to do this ourselves, and it's some sacrifice, but it's going to be it's going to become something meaningful because if this were the Hilton, they would say, in order for us to become something that uh, we, that is sustainable, in order for us to be able to keep our employees. <coughs> and keep our business running, we need to change, we need to transform ourselves, raising money to transform ourselves into the uh, hotel that is the cheapest, into the hotel that everybody wants to go to because we're the best. And that's essentially what we're turning Guam Memorial Hospital into, and why we need money in order to do that and make that investment. You don't want to lose sight or lose focus on what we're doing here. It is to get the hospital to be able to sustain its operations, not just for today or tomorrow, but forever. And uh, the way to do that, as we've done, Governor Cal has done with the tax refunds, uh, you have to address the problem now. And at that time, it was getting people their money back. It's this time, it's to get the hospital able to provide quality health care and services to the patients. And you can't do that when your resources are strapped. Uh, you need your nurses, you need your doctors. If their payroll is challenged, you have that issue. We don't want doctors, nurses, uh, respiratory therapists worrying about will they get their paycheck. Uh, we want to clear this once and for all. And the way to do this is, I think, the best uh, that we could come up with and with the work of all of you is what we are proposing in this bill. This is the ranch, this is home, and this is where we're going to focus our time and attention. And uh, some electrical upgrades um, that are needed for the hospital uh, panel, um, and uh, that's paid that uh, five million dollars. So, you know, we're looking not just at beds and, and needles and syringes, we're looking at facilities, uh, we're looking at equipment, we're looking at the you know, IT upgrades, electrical upgrades, it, it's, it really is a comprehensive approach. So the total that we're, we're, we're going to be approaching the legislature with for this portion of the you know, CIP work is $125 million. First major point, uh, in order to get the hospital to where it needs to be, we have to fully fund these transformative uh, initiatives that are designed to create two things. Uh, the first would be a center of excellence, which I'll get into, and then looking at an integrated system of health care, health and medical care. We've been meeting for six months. We've been briefing with hospital staff on occasion, and it's summarized in this. In a nutshell, as we keep bringing to the table, these transformative initiatives are hinging, they're pivoting on two major themes here. The creation of the hospital as a center of excellence, but if you know your business well, we're looking at anywhere from six to nine centers of excellence. Some examples include a cardiac center, MRI, IR center. Sometimes they put me on the spot and actually put I, IR stands for it. On occasion, I forget. So when you spell it out like an oncology center, these are the types of things that we're looking to invest money in so that you can grow what they call the top line of your budget document, your finance document. So that when you walk away, this operation is expanded or what we call in the business scaled up so that your net gain is realized to help carry the costs where those folks who are self-paid or non-pay are unable to provide uh, that remittance. Something very unique to the conversation that extends beyond the walls of this campus is subsidized employer insurance and managed health care insurance for the uninsured and or uninsured. And so we're going to get to that hopefully by the end of the presentation. <coughs> We hope to use the latter part of the discussion to entertain any questions you might have about some of the investment monies that we hope to infuse into the hospital and its affiliate activities through what we're dubbing the Healthcare and Insurance Industries Investment. 
Um, I'm going to close with this, and then maybe some members of HMAT can jump in, uh, anybody from Lester to, to Jay. <coughs> there is no alternate option. Paying down last month's power bill, to be overly simplistic, is not an option. What this plan attempts to do through Governor Calvo's efforts and advocacy is to establish a long-term sustainability plan so that you don't have to come back every two to four years for a bid. The only way to do that would be to make those major investments in plants and equipment, which will include the refurbishments, furniture, equipment, etc. Of course, we're going to go back and pay down your liabilities anywhere from the two to fifteen to twenty-five million dollars, and these folks can jump in and, and further articulate that. Uh, but those are the major areas for investment. With that, looking work that we are looking at with HMAT with this particular bill. Uh, anybody on the floor want to add to that in terms of the finance structure? If not, let me again just leave you with one more thought. This is the plan doesn't call for any single proposed type tax hike. It actually presents an array of options to provide a sustainable source of funding, a predictable external source of funding. Because as Troy mentioned, after speaking with you, and we don't work here, after working with you and capturing your thoughts and your activities right here in the report, we acknowledge that you already cut three and a half to five million dollars a year. Governor Calvert stepped in instantaneously, revoked an 8% payer discount as one example. That means we're able to recover $1.2 million a year. Because he's pushing really hard, we're trying to get the RP out, and thanks to your chief planner and his administrative team, that RP for the solar project is closing at the end of the month, which what is projected to save us anywhere from thirty to $60,000. We didn't stop there. The CFA made it a point to infuse an additional half a million dollars within the provisions of law so that we can increase that infusion, I mean that realized uh, cost savings in terms of energy efficiencies. Frank Wuhan, unfortunately, is not there. He's been a tremendous champion with your IT department who's very competent in shutting down dual payments for two existing systems and instead cutting a check once or for all to be able to pair these two systems so that you can bill at the maximum amount rate possible. I sat in this room when somebody said, I can only drop the final billing, looking for her, at half a million dollars a day. When in fact the potential for the gross billing at the end of the day, the final billing, is like two million dollars. That's just the tip of the iceberg. That's 330,000 to get us to that level. When it's all said and done, based on the recommendations of their IT department and the GMHA community, we're looking at an infusion of $20 million, which is nominal compared to other state and territory hospital systems, unified systems of healthcare, need to invest in a technology system. By the way, there are those who have said not once but many times that they attempt to attribute the shortfall in your operational revenues to this loose concept known as GMHA lacking the internal capacity. As a matter of fact, you even drill down and say, it's your coding error. And just today, I could—I almost fell out of my chair in senior staff that I got an articulated response from uh, your internal management here that it's less than 1% of all disputed claims. So it's important you know that. It's important you know where your successes are. Because when we go to battle for you, you have to refute that claim. And in fact, you've done a heck of a job at looking at your claims, and we're going to step in now. We've done what we could in what they call internal controls, right? Things like billing, things like energy efficiency. Those are internal controls. Now we're looking to grow your business so you can stand on your own two feet. There are 165,000 lungs in this island that need this hospital. There are 165,000 people with limbs who will have an injury, will get sick, who need this hospital. And if, if we dare to dream that we can make the best international event, or we can dare to say we can have the best capital, why cannot we dare to have the best darn health facility, not only in Guam, but in the whole region? to what I said earlier. We're not going to be every three or four years drowning and some arm picks you up and you take three deep breaths and then you go down for the next three or four years. We are going to take this hospital and our healthcare system to its greatest heights. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is my commitment to you. Uh, we have laid out the plan and by the way, the timing is never right. I know of an election here, but I wasn't expecting everything to happen and I become a board of a hospital to begin the new year. And things happen. 
sometimes things happen for a purpose. I'm a guy that does believe there is a higher level for all of us here. And sometimes in the worst of times, something good comes from it. Mm -hmm. And I do believe in, in, a, in a most trying time for a hospital, good is coming. I'm committed to this. I'm committed to you folks. God bless you, Guam Memorial Hospital. And let's, let's continue to dream. Let's continue to fight for being the best. And I, you have got my back in 100, 150%. God bless and thank you, GMH. Thank you.